So welcome everyone to our you know insurance talk today. This is Andy Fazio with Econ. He's going to go ahead and do a short presentation, and then we're going to leave lots of time for questions after the fact. So I'm going to turn it right over to you, Andy. Thank you so much, Marcy, and thank you for giving me this opportunity. Um, for those of you who do not know me, uh, my name is Andy Fazio. I'm the sales manager at Ecomp, which is a division of Granite Insurance Brokers. We are a full service uh, licensed insurance agency based out of uh, Livermore, California. Um, I personally reside in Rochester, New York, right in Fairport. Um, so if uh, any of you are local, um, shout out to you, it's a great area. Uh, but Marcy and I connected uh, maybe about a year ago, I think, at this point, um, to talk about uh, her insurances and the importance of E&O, uh, which kind of led us to here. And um, I can't thank you enough for the opportunity. Um, but a little bit of background about me. I'm born and raised right here in, in Rochester. I was actually, uh, I went to Pittsburgh Menden High School and then went to SUNY Oswego uh, for college. And um, when I got out of college, you know, I went to film school, so there weren't many options here locally. Um, I did a quick internship with the Brother Wee Show back in 2010, um, and then decided to take the same steps my father did as an insurance agent, um, because I saw the life that he provided for his family and wanted to a just more realistic way of living, because uh, I think you have to move to LA or New York City to join the film side of things, and that just wasn't in the cards for me. So um, I started my career actually at Paychex, which uh, obviously is headquartered here and a lot of my friends also uh, started there and um, spent about two years at Paychex and then went to another local insurance agency for about seven years. And now I'm with Ecomp and I believe this will be my forever home. Um, so I've been working in insurance now for about 13 years, been licensed and today wanted to talk about the importance of e &O insurance specifically for notaries such as yourself. Um, Hopefully most of you have notary e &O insurance. It is a professional liability policy that plays a huge important role for not only the uh, legal uh, transactions that you're working on and then the financial transactions that you guys are attesting to, um, but we know that mistakes can happen and notaries can be held liable for those mistakes. Um, so it's important to protect yourself, not only from an e &O standpoint, from a business standpoint, but from a personal standpoint as well. Um, so today I'll talk about, you know, just a quick high level overview of, you know, what is notary e &O insurance? Um, do I buy a standalone policy or do I attach this to my general liability, for example? Um, so again, you know, notary e -insur e &O insurance is a professional liability policy to help protect you from financial consequences of claims that can arise from that. Um, it can cover claims related to uh, errors or omissions that you make while performing your, your acts and can also um, you know, cover any type of legal defense cost if you are brought into a lawsuit. Um, and I'll talk about um, a standalone policy versus a, uh, an attachment that you can add to your general liability. Um, Marcy has already sent me over a couple of notaries to help out with for e &O. I think a couple of them I helped out on a standalone basis, meaning I wrote just a professional liability policy for that entity. Um, now I know in the notary space, because I recently bought a, well, I can't believe I'm saying this, 10 years ago I bought a home. And when I went through the legal transactions, there was a notary there to notarize all those documents. And that happened in an office setting away from the premises that the notary typically would work from, whether that's from their office or their home. That's where the general liability component uh, becomes a part of that. So if any of you reach out to me for a quote, that's a, a discussion we can have. You know, do you leave your office to do your notary services? Um, if not, we can look at a standalone policy. However, I believe it's best to attach the notary e &O insurance with your general liability, because if you go out to a real estate office or if you meet a client somewhere and you cause any third party property damage, for example, that's where general liability would kick in. And then obviously we would attach a notary e &O, um, endorsement on that to make sure that you're properly covered for that professional liability. And that can be very cost effective especially when you combine them. Because again, most, most uh, notaries are gonna need general liability anyway. 
um, unless you're working remote or, or if you have people come to your office where it's not as needed, but would highly recommend uh, attaching this to your general liability insurance as well. Um, I, I also wanted to cover just a, a few claim examples and, and just kind of what I've seen in, in the industry. You know, hopefully we never, you know, see these things happen, uh, but they do happen. Uh, for example, failure to properly identify a signer. You know, notaries are responsible for verifying the identity of anyone signing a specific document. And if you fail to do so, that document can technically be invalid um, and you can be held liable for that. Um, so that's where an ENO policy is going to kick in and pay your legal defense costs or, you know, help you go against that lawsuit, especially if you get, you know, roped into something that may not even be your fault. Um, another common, you know, claim example is failure to administer an oath or an affirmation. Um, you know, you guys are responsible to administer oaths and affirmations when, re when required by law. Um, but if you fail to do that, that document can also then be invalid, um, and then the notary can be held liable in those cases as well. Um, improper notarizations, false representation, you know, failure to maintain um, accurate, proper records, and unauthorized practice of law. So there's various different claims that can happen. Some you may not be a part of, some you may be a part of. And I think the best thing that I can say about these policies and, and what I will do for you is make sure to find a carrier that responds for the accusation of. Um, so there, there doesn't have to be a technical claim, but if you're accused of something, um, I would personally find a policy for you that pays at the accusation of versus a, uh, an actual claim um, you know, that, that has to be processed by the carrier. And that's so important because accusations happen all the time. Uh, whether they're valid or not, that's something that would be proved in court. Uh, but the uh, e &O policy will also provide those legal defense costs for you to help you go to court, manage your, your financials with paying a lawyer, an attorney. That's the peace of mind that the policy provides, not only from a financial standpoint, but from a reputation standpoint too. Um, you know, you don't want your name to be tarnished or you don't want to be seen, <clears throat> seen in the news for something that could happen that could, uh, you know, affect your business and your reputation. So having this policy in place will not only provide that peace of mind, but, um, you know, it's something that you all should have. Um, so if you're a current notary or you're considering becoming a notary, you know, e and insurance is definitely something you want to have in addition to general liability or, or they can be combined um, and I can also help with any other insurance related products that you, you may need. Um, but I know today was, um, you know, specific to the, the notary e &O insurance, and um, that's why I'm here. Um, so you may be asking, like, where do we get our coverage from? So we are an independent insurance agency, and we have markets through Hartford, uh, Travelers, CNA, Guard. I mean, we partner with over 30 different carriers in general um, to, to give us kind of that depth to shop rates, you know, find that adequate coverage where claims are covered at the accusation of. Um, and I will go to every single market to make sure that I'm finding you not only the best limit coverage and price, um, but a carrier that's financially backed, A rated by the Better Business Bureau since we only work with carriers that are A rated, for example. Um, but before I continue, does anybody have any questions so far? I mean, we, we do only... have a question about okay. remote online notarization. So um, that's when the notarization is done completely by audio visual communication and the signature on the notarization is electronic. Would that be covered under a traditional <clears throat> you know, insurance policy? So that's a great question, because obviously technology is kind of revamping the way we do things. So like I know, for example, I think like I use DocuSign when I send out any type of paperwork to my clients. And I think DocuSign has been toying around with a notary component to it as well. Um, you guys would know better than me as far as the remote operations do uh, before these transactions happen. Are there any disclosures that are presented to you? because that might help me better answer the question. Meaning, before you go live with that call or that notarization process, is there any type of disclosures or disclaimers that have to be uh, either disclosed to either party involved about the online transaction itself? Because I, I have to imagine remote online notary is new or newer. 
Uh, well, I mean, it's new here in New York. Other states have had it longer. So each state may or may not have something that they need to say, whether it's a matter of, you know, um, you know, asking where they're located or, or they're saying where they're located, but there isn't an actual disclaimer like, hey, this is remote online notarization. Okay. It's still considered notarization. So I think we're looking at, is this something that would need to be inclusive of maybe a cyber policy or because it's notarization in its form, whether it's electronic or in person or what signature I should say, it would that all be inclusive under that ENO policy. Yes. So th those those would be covered because at the end of the day, the actions are still the same. You're still verifying a document and um, those claims would be covered whether they're remote or in person. This kind of goes off tangent for a minute, but can you explain um, what exactly cyber insurance is and what it does? Like, what does it cover? Yeah, so cyber insurance, and I'm, I'm sure everybody's kind of heard the buzz about cyber lately over the past couple of years, just given what's going on overseas in Ukraine. And um, just the, you know, Target, I think, suffered a, a data breach, you know, many years ago. I think the oil pipeline in the Midwest was ha suffered a data breach or a cyber attack. So the way that cyber insurance is a little bit different than like notary E&O is, again, the notary E&O is, is professional liability. So if someone accuses you um, or, you know, says that, you know, a document was invalid, that's that's a professional act or an error in an omission. Whereas a cyber policy, if you think about your website, for example, if somebody hacks into your website and installs malware and they start leaking either client information that they can pull from it's your database, a cloud-based system, and they start leaking that information to the dark web and one of your clients suffers a loss due to that, those types of claims would be example, or um, those types of claims would be covered. Um, the biggest thing with cyber insurance is the data breach response notification. So let's say you're, um, you have a, a, a client base of 30 clients that you, you maybe consistently notarize things for, maybe it's a real estate agency like Remax, for example, and your website and your information gets um, compromised, you're legally responsible to notify all of your clients that you've suffered a breach. Um, I was one of the recipients of that target email that went out probably five years ago that said, hey, we've suffered a data breach. We're doing everything to mitigate that. Uh, but you are legally responsible, responsible to notify your clients that you've suffered a breach. And if you don't have a cyber policy in place to pay for that, um, you know, the man hours that go into it. So meaning if you have to notify 100 clients or 10,000 clients, whatever it may be, that's a lot of legwork for somebody in an office to do. Um, so not only will the, the carrier cover that, the data breach response notification costs, there's many other components to a cyber liability policy that are, are beneficial to you. Um, so for example, another common claim would be extortion. If somebody held your system or your cloud base uh, at ransom um, and extorted you, the carrier is going to pay that extortion or that ransom payment. Um, and it also covers any legal fees. So again, if a client says that you're liable or you were negligent for the, you know, the loss that they suffered and they sue you, the legal defense costs would also be covered by the carrier as well. Um, and it goes even further than that. If you lost revenue because if someone held your system for a week and you finally got the carrier to pay the extortion or the ransom amount, um, they would also pay for your lost revenue for the days that you were not able to bring in that revenue. So it's a little bit different because again, you know, I think of cyber insurance, you know, super beneficial for a restaurant that has a point of sale system where a hacker could install malware and steal credit card information, uh, hack into your website to steal client information. It's, it's honestly important for everybody. Um, and I'd be happy to have that discussion, you know, on a case by case basis to make sure that you're adequately covered or if it's something that you truly need. Um, but in my professional opinion, for the cost, um, you know, for the premium that outweighs the claims that come along with that, it's well worth your time to not only just see a quote, but just understand the value that comes along with cyber liability insurance, especially in this day and age where we're relying on technology heavily. So Andy, um, there, you know, notaries are the republic. Uh, notaries public of course and then there's you know signing agents or loan signing agents so you know from our having a conversation in the past where there's just additional duties that signing agents are responsible for 
you know, dropping packages in FedEx and making sure other documents are signed. And so there could be other, um, you know, actions against notaries beyond just the notarial piece. Are there riders or is there additional coverage that notaries can get? Is it, I, I should say, is it, I assume that those items are not covered under e insurance, um, but if they are, that's great. If they aren't, is there additional coverage that they would uh, be able to get to cover some of those acts? Um, yes. So, um, you know, again, the key components to the e insurance is going to be negligence, the errors and omissions, any misrepresentation, uh, violation of good faith and fair dealing, or inaccurate advice. Um, the best thing I could say to provide additional coverage would be to look at an umbrella policy. And what that would do is it would provide additional coverage over the underlying limits of your e &O policy. Um, however, you know, we, I, usually I'm quoting, you know, depending on what limit you need, but if you have a million dollar e &O policy, that's pretty adequate coverage. Uh, but for somebody like me, um, when I purchased my home, I also purchased an umbrella liability policy, which gives me an additional million dollars in coverage of liability insurance over what's on my homeowner's liability. Um, so that kind of, you know, as a safeguard, we can always look at an umbrella or we can look at even higher tiered limits. Um, those are obviously always an option as well. And, and again, could be a case by case basis, depending on what your revenue projections are, you know, what you feel um, you know, is adequate for your business. And if you already have, you know, insurance, I'd be happy to kind of comb through what you have, you know, make recommendations. Even if you don't go with me, I'm happy to comb through what you currently have and say, this is where I think you could make an improvement, or I think you're overpaying or whatever it may be. I'm happy to just take a look at that, provide my expert advice on that, um, and then just have that conversation. Uh, but I think um, to answer your question, Marcy, an additional umbrella policy would provide you an additional, you know, additional coverage over the underlying limits, meaning if you exhausted the, the limit for your E&O policy, an umbrella policy could kick in uh, to help cover anything above and beyond what's not covered. Great. So we get a lot of notaries who ask, like, how, how much coverage do I really need? And so in the loan signing world, I would say standard is like a $25,000 policy. And then some underwriters ask for more of a hundred or 200,000. But within that space, there, I think notaries need to know kind of the idea of how do they determine that coverage outside of what the industry says is standard? Are there certain guidelines they should be looking at? Or you know, how do you help them determine what their coverage should be? Yeah, I mean, to be honest with you, um, I would say eight out of 10 times, clients are coming to me with some sort of requirement that was set forth by somebody else. Um, so I'm either, you know, matching those limits for them to make sure they're adequate or, you know, just having that conversation, you know, if it fits within your budget and you can have a higher limit, I, I'm always going to advise for something like that. Or if you're just wanting to stick to whatever's being set forth as a requirement, whether it's by, um, you know, a vendor you work with or, um, you know, a notary alliance that you're a part of, it's, it's always going to be a case by case. I think the last one I did was a $300,000 limit um, because the, the client told me that their current insurance could only go up to $100,000. Um, but there's various you know, tiers of limits. Um, and again, I'm happy to have that conversation on a case by case basis, but um, it really depends on what your needs are and uh, if you have any specific requirements that somebody's holding you to. Great. So I know you touched on this a little bit, but I want to bring it up to the forefront because I think it's very important. There are lots of times where I talk to notaries and they say, well, I don't have e &O insurance. I don't think I need it. I, I mean, I never make a mistake. Right. So can you again address why e &O would be insurance for someone who is perfect and never makes a mistake? <laughs> well, you know, you want to protect yourself. And I think most of you would be surprised to see the premiums that come along. I think for the $300,000 limit that I wrote a few weeks ago was a $300 policy for the year. Um, so for $300 to provide peace of mind, I mean, right, we'd like to all think that we're perfect. I like to think that I'm perfect. I make mistakes. My wife will tell me that all the time. Um, but it, it could be um, finding out that someone forged your signature on those documents, um, unintentionally breaking the law by notarizing paperwork, or you know making an error that causes public harm. Things that may be outside of your control, because uh, again, we can we can be a master of our craft and say that we don't make mistakes. But when that one mistake happens, you're going to say, "Man, I really wish I you know had contacted that Andy guy over at Ecom for a policy." 
um, because I'm, I'm more interested in protecting you and helping you guys make sure that you have that peace of mind, because if something does happen, you're going to think back and it's going to help you sleep at night. Um, again, claims happen all the time, especially in insurance. I see it on a day by day basis. I know a lot of people don't like insurance. You know, there's the Murphy's law, right? If, if, if uh, something happens, it's going to really happen and, and, um, and it could be a worst case scenario. Um, so for anyone out there that says, you know, I cross my uh, T's and dot my I's and I'm very efficient in what I do. Awesome. Shout out to you guys um, because I do the same thing in, in my industry too. But our, our insurance agency holds an E&O policy for a reason. You know, I have agents underneath me that are working for me. And if they make a mistake, that's on the agency. If you have employees that are working for you um, that are also notaries, um, it could very well fall back on you as well. But I would say for the people who think, you know, that are, you know, and I know that it's true that you don't make mistakes, it's still worthwhile purchasing a policy just to make sure that a, you know, one of these claims don't happen. Again, if somebody forged your signature on a document, you can get roped into that lawsuit until you prove that, you know, that was forged. And if you don't have an E&O policy to back you on that, then you're going to have to pay the legal defense costs to go to court, which can be very, not only time consuming, but costly. If you know the, you know, hourly rate of an average law, a lawyer, I have to imagine that's on the upward side of hundred to $200 an hour when you could have a policy for $300 to cover and provide you that peace of mind. And that's a great point, right? It's not necessarily that the notary or the signing agent made an error. They may not have made an error, but they still could be pulled into a lawsuit by virtue of just having been part of that transaction. And, you know, insurance would cover those legal fees in that instance. Am I understanding that correctly? Yes, exactly. That's where the legal defense cost is going to kick in, is when somebody brings a lawsuit against you, you're going to call your carrier and, and let them know, and then they're going to provide all the legal defense costs, the advice and the services um, to, to, you know, go to court and fight that lawsuit. Um, so again, you know, even if you fail to maintain proper records, I mean, it, it goes beyond just, you know, saying that I'm, I'm you know, profession in my craft. It's just, it, it's to me, again, it's peace of mind, right? Because like, sure, I can say that I may not make a mistake, but when that mistake happens, you know, that's when people say, man, I, I should have done that, right? Um, so, you know, I would, I would just say, have the conversation with me if you're unsure and you want to walk through a few different examples or um, situations that you're specifically involved in, I'm happy to go through that. Um, but again, it's, it's, um, there's so many different components to how a claim can be brought forth. And the fact that these policies tend to pay at the accusation of, I think, is the most important thing because people can accuse all day long, whether it's true or not, that'll be pr proved in court. It's just a matter of, do you want to take that chance of paying for a, a lawyer in those legal defense costs uh, out of your own expense? Right. So somebody asked, um, so would the policy cover fraud as well as a mistake? Yes. So it's going to depend on, you know, the level of fraud, whether that's coming from, you know, maybe the client that you notarized the document for, but if you're the source of that notary, then yes, because obviously we're going to, we're going to prove in court that a fraudulent document was signed. Um, and obviously you still have to go to court and go through those motions. Um, but that's what the legal defense, they're on your side, you know, they don't want to pay out on claims, but that's the risk the insurance company is taking because the definition of insurance is the transfer of risk. They're offering you a premium to take on the risk. Um, so, you know, I hope that answers your question. But, you know, for example, you know, if, if a notary fails to, um, you know, administer an oath or an administration or, or fails to properly do that, those documents can be invalid and, and you can be held liable. So there's just so many components where you can be held liable. Even like you said, if it's fraud, they're going to prove that in court. But it, it's the fact that you get roped into the lawsuit from the beginning is, is the point that I'm trying to make. Even if you're technically, you know, you didn't commit fraud or you're technically not liable, if you get roped into a lawsuit, there's a, there's a cost associated in doing that. Um, and with the remote stuff, if you're doing it out of state, you know, that's also going to cover your, your flights, your hotels. If it's out of state and you have to go to Arizona, for example, for a court hearing, you know, all that's going to be covered versus you paying it out of pocket. And when you weigh the cost of a premium versus, you know, paying that out of your own pocket, 
you know, you'll, you'll, you'll truly see the value in that um, because these, you know, policies are very, you know, very affordable that provide a lot of coverage. That's great information. So someone else would like to know, um, what if we were in the wrong and we got sued for monetary damages, which policy best covers that? Um, so that's going to also be the errors and emissions, because, you know, when you think about general liability insurance, you know, there's two components. You have your property insurance and your uh, liability. So typically a general liability is going to cover, you know, if somebody came into your commercial establishment, if you have an office, they slip and they fall, that's your general liability insurance. Or if you go out to like a real estate agency to notarize documents for a real estate transaction and you cause any type of third party property damage, that's general liability, um, where the E&O is going to specifically cover uh, those types of, of claims specific to any error in emission. Great. Someone wants to know, have you personally dealt with a notary claim? Um, in the 13 years that I've been doing this, thank you know, knock on wood, I have not seen a notary claim. Um, Personally, I, you know, I've had colleagues that have had them. I've heard stories and obviously you can, you know, you can research online about notary claims, but me personally, I have not had a client thankfully come to me and say, I'm being roped into a lawsuit. And that's just me personally. I do have colleagues though at the, at, at our office. And again, my father was an agent for 50 years and I know he's had those types of claims, but it's very few and far between. Um, you guys do a great job. I mean, especially like when I said, when I did my, my homeowner's transaction, I mean, it was a very fluid, easy process. I mean, even when I, um, when I refinanced my mortgage, I believe I had that there was a notary there as well. Um, so I know that you guys, you know, again, you cross your T's and you dot your I's, you do everything efficiently. So it's, it is rare that a claim comes about, but it's when that claim happens is, is when you are going to be thankful you have that, uh, that coverage. But being truthful and honest with everybody in this room, I have not thankfully had any client come to me saying they need to file a claim against their policy. Well, we're thankful for that too. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, Does so, anyone else have any questions for Andy? You can certainly raise your hand. I can unmute you if you want to ask yourself. You can put it in the chat or the Q&A. Jason, I'm unmuting you so you can feel okay. free to ask your question if you'd like. So we have the policy and we get a notification that we are going to be roped into a lawsuit. Um, how soon does the policy start paying for you know the initial conver you know conversation with the you know whether whatever lawyer we need to engage? Do you help, you know, locate independent counsel? Is that something that you have like a referral list? How does that work as far as how quickly it, we, we don't have to be spending our own money or we have to spend our own money and then we'll get reimbursed via the policy? Can you talk about that, please? Absolutely. So if you think about any other type of insurance claim, whether it's your home, your auto, um, any other product that you insure, the first thing that you're going to do is file a claim with your carrier. Um, so every carrier probably has a different uh, list of counsel that they're going to advise you to, to connect with. Um, but the first thing you're going to do is file the claim. Let's say it's the Hartford, for example, with the, the client I helped out a few weeks ago. Um, whether it's me calling with you or you calling directly, it's just like any other product. You have to call the carrier to file the claim since they're the one furnishing the coverage. And then they're going to assign you a claims adjuster to walk you throughout that process. Um, so I know, for example, when I write workers' comp insurance, every carrier has a sub list of medical providers for their employees to seek from. Um, there is no waiting period. Like with a cyber policy, there's a waiting period for that claim to kick in. I think typically it's six hours up to 24 hours, um, but there is no waiting period for the coverage to uh, start applying, um, there might be a, a clause for the, the business income. Sometimes there's a waiting period for like the lost revenue if you suffer a loss for the revenue. Um, but to answer your question, every carrier is going to have a network of counsel in their wheelhouse that they're going to advise you that you speak to. Um, and they, the carrier themselves, will guide you throughout that process. Um, me as the broker, I can help you with all those steps. But at the end of the day, again, it's like your home or your auto. 
you can call your broker, but they're going to tell you, you know, let's call the carrier so they can document the claim and start the process of assigning you a claims adjuster to, to walk you throughout that process and what that looks like. So just to reiterate, you wouldn't have to pay out of your own pocket the retainer fee or whatever. That's going to be immediate via the policy up, up to the policy limits, of course. Um, correct. So I can, um, you know, what I can do is kind of circle back. I think it's going to be a case by case with the, the carrier because I'm, I'm thinking in my mind, you know, let's say you call an attorney and they say we need a retainer at this very moment. You know, you're not going to have the Hartford's credit card on file. Um, so that's something I can find out and, and kind of circle back and provide an update on whether, um, you know, the carrier facilitates it with the law firm directly, or if for some reason you had to put down the retainer to, to secure that law firm, uh, would that be reimbursed in the policy? And I will find that out and, and either provide that information to Marcy, or um, I can send out a recap if I get a distribution uh, list for emails. But I'd like to call a few different carriers and kind of pick their brains and kind of see if everybody has a similar common denominator in that regard. But my initial thought would be they would cover the entire expense from beginning to end. And what about we, we you touched on, you know, like, you know, someone got hacked and your, you know, your information on your servers got compromised potentially and you have to go through this notification process of your clients. Um, you said something about, you know, the, the policy assisting in that regard. Is that just covering whatever cost is incurred by the notary? you know, making that happen, or you have some sort of service you could tap into that's covered under the policy that does a huge notification um, that, you know, may be onerous for us, but they do this all the time. Yeah, great question. I think every carrier provides a different level of service, but um, the data breach response notification costs is what is what's going to immediately pay out. Meaning if you had to spend 10 hours having your employees um, notify your clients, they're going to pay you the time that it took for those wages uh, for your employees. And, and um, certainly, again, the lost revenue, if you have lost revenue from um, either having to focus on that, or if you lost revenue due to the loss, you, that'll be covered. Um, but they will, they will cover the, the cost that it costs you to notify your clients to do that. And typically what we see with that is it's, it's the labor of the man hours to, to do that with your employees, meaning if two employees had to stay after work for five hours every night to notify your clients, those, those wages would be paid for by the cyber policy versus like the E&O, for example. And does your firm, does it also um, access, you know, like, I don't know what the appropriate term is, but let's say, you know, there's a new pandemic and you're, you can't work for three weeks or, you know, you break your leg and you can't, you know, meet clients, you know, is there uh, policies that you offer that cover when you just literally can't work and you have missed wages? Um, I'm trying to think that through because if for some reason, like if, if you couldn't work due to a work-related injury, you know, typically those are covered by workers' comp insurance. Um, I guess I'd need to, I'd need a, if, do you have an example? I'm trying to, uh, understand that meaning like if you broke your leg if that happened at work you know your workers comp would would respond if you're included on that or if you don't have workers comp um because you don't have any employees uh, maybe your health insurance would pick that up or typically you know in new york state especially if you get if you get injured away from the job that's a disability claim a new york state disability and paid family leave because I think of, you know, injuries on the job as workers' comp and injuries away from the job is, is disability. And both of those policies have components to either pay you for your lost wages, um, whether it's the workers' comp or the disability, they both have a component where they're paying out your lost time up to a certain percentage. Okay, um, and, and so those two things you, you don't necessarily work with, that's something else we need to locate, locate for ourselves. Well, for example, if you have employees, you should have workers' comp insurance, and that is something we provide. Um, I provide that for Marcy's uh, business, I believe, and her general liability, her cyber. Um, but we, we're a full-service agency, so we have access to workers' comp, 
New York State disability and paid family leave, cyber liability, the E and O, general liability, you know, umbrella policies, pretty much everything we can do on a commercial insurance basis, except for personal lines. We don't do uh, like home and auto, for example. Gotcha. Okay. So if you, if you have employees, I would be more than happy to shop a workers' comp in New York State disability. Uh, we have great carriers for that. We use Shelter Point Life for the New York State disability and paid family leave, um, and it's a fantastic product. Um, and I was a recipient of that when uh, we had our first child in 2018. And again, in 2021, I was finally able to, to benefit from 12 weeks of paid family leave, which was incredible time spent with my, my kids and wife. Great. Great questions. Thank you. I did put Andy's information in the chat, his phone number and his email. He graciously agreed to review your policies. So you, if you have personal questions about your personal policy or, you know, even uh, looking at something that you currently have, then I'm sure you'd be happy to answer any questions if you wanted to email him directly. Andy, someone asked, do you charge a fee as a broker? Great question. Um, no. And the reason I don't do that is because just like any home or your auto agent or your commercial broker, we all get paid a commission from the carrier for placing business with them. Uh, so as much as I would love to charge a broker fee, we don't need to because we get paid, you know, like from Travelers and Hartford. If I place a policy with them, they're going to pay our agency a commission for it. Great. Um, and back to the coverage question. So someone asked, you know, with the policy amount have something to do with also is to where they live and the amount involved in the transaction. So, you know, we talk about New York State in general, the property values are a little bit lower here in upstate New York. And so is the cost of living versus if you were in New York City. Would that determine a little bit what your policy coverage would be? Um, as far as location, like, like using that example, like like if I quote somebody in Rochester with the same parameters as somebody down in New York City? Well, for notaries, I think the, th the thought is, is there more risk? Like, would they be more inclined? Would the claim be higher if they're doing business in New York City, dealing with a property down there, than if I were, you know, in upstate New York or, I don't know, Nebraska, right? Like the difference between just those areas, would that have some play in what the coverage would be? I, I haven't seen a, a, a crazy price difference in that regard. Like, well, like with workers' comp insurance, um, you know, rates might be a little bit higher in New York City just because there's heavier claim situations that happen in New York City versus like up here. Same thing in California. All the carriers rate the workers' comp rates by the zip codes in California because they see in LA County, in Los Angeles, there's a high number of claims versus down in San Diego where the rates are much better. Um, from an E&O standpoint, I would not say that there would be a vast difference. The only time I could see that playing a difference is if we wrote your general liability policy and, you, you know, we're insuring your commercial space in New York City that may have a higher rate than a commercial facility here in Rochester. But for the E&O coverage itself, I don't think the, the, I don't think the zip code where you're in dictates a, a rate increase. Uh, but that's a great question. I, I, I haven't seen... Um, I haven't noticed that, no. But I would say if we're writing you a general liability policy that we're attaching an a e and no endorsement on, where you're located and where we're insuring that property would have an impact on the pricing, if that makes sense from a general liability standpoint. Right, and if I, let's just say when we talk about coverage, I, you know, for a million dollar coverage or $2 million coverage, would that notary in New York City, would it be probable? I think they're, what they're trying to figure out is, would they, would they need more coverage because they're in possibly higher property value, higher risk areas, and the claim against them might be more significant than someone in a, you know, lower property value area? Or does that just not, is that not part of the determination of what the coverage would be for that individual? Yeah, I don't think it's a part of the, I don't think it's a part of the equation that goes into pricing general, or uh, your errors and emissions. Um, I, I would think that the exposures, whether you're in New York City or in Rochester, are the same. You know, the same claims can happen, the same mistakes can be made, no matter the value of a property. Um, really, what what the claim is covering is your error or omission. Um, and I don't think the location or property value, for example, would would play into that. 
Um, and that's why, um, you know, working with me, I can provide you various different limit options. You know, again, I, I think I wrote the $300,000 limit a few weeks ago for one of your referrals, Marcy, um, because their current carrier couldn't exceed 100,000. And we can go up to a million. So I can, we can play with those limits and say, you know, what's your budget? Would it give you peace of mind at a higher limit of liability? And then maybe look at some of the requirements that you've had set forth for you in the past and say, yeah, I, I see a lot of, <clears throat> excuse me, requirements at a million or 500,000. And then we can kind of make a determination and say, you know, is this limit adequate and is it within my budget? Um, but I would say, you know, we can play around with a few different scenarios to say, you know, does this make sense for me? Great. Do we have any other questions? Okay, well, Andy's information is in the chat. Feel free to write it down. If you didn't write it down or don't have it after we close out, you can certainly reach out to me, but absolutely reach out to Andy uh, directly. Andy, thank you so much for this information. I truly appreciate it. Very grateful that you have the time to talk to us about e insurance and how important it is for our businesses. Yes, of course. And uh, it, it, it's been a whirlwind kind of day because I actually just had an employee put in their two weeks notice. Um, so there is a lot for me to deal with after this call, but I can't thank you guys enough for having me on. Um, you know, maybe we can do this again, you know, as the Notary Alliance grows. Uh, Marcy, you're fantastic. Um, shout out to you and everybody on the call. Make sure you protect yourself. If you don't have E&O insurance, I would behoove you to get a quote just to see the price and have that peace of mind. Um, again, I'm up in Fairport, New York for anyone that joined late. Um, I have a 925 California area code because Ecomp is based out of California, but I'm right here in Fairport, New York. So don't hesitate to reach out at any time. And Andy can write in other states. So even though he's yes. here in New York, it's important for us to know any other people who are on here who are not in New York, that he can look at your policies for all the states, Andy, for most of yes. the states. I'm licensed in all 50 states. And so is uh, our agency, Ecomp. All right, perfect. Thank you so much. I hope you all have a great weekend. Enjoy. Be safe out there if it's bad weather you are, but enjoy. And Andy, thank you again so much for your time today. Yes, of course. Thank you so much, Marcy.